This is Real Estate Rookie episode 159er. As a real estate agent, if there's agents listening, your job should be to find off-market deals. And the first question should be, should I buy this? And if the answer is yes, then buy it. And then the second is, if it doesn't meet your criteria, then you should be selling it to us investors. And so I want to find out more about the agent. How are they finding deals? That's where I find out really quickly that if they're just going to put me on a drip campaign with like an MLS search, that's not the right agent for me. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I'm here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Podcast, where we celebrate every episode that ends in a nine with a famous quote from Tommy Boy, where we're also here to bring you good information about real estate investing and hopefully give you the uh, inspiration, education, and everything you need to get started. So Ashley Kerr, what's, uh, what's going on? What's new? Well, I'm working on a cabin remodel right now. I bought this tiny little A-frame cabin that I'm just in love with, and it's gutted. And today the the bathroom was being put back together. So really excited for this project. It's actually going to be a short term rental, Tony. Boom. I can't wait to come check it out. Stay for free. So I, obviously that's a perk of being a, a co-host of yours, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're going to be the first guest that gets the COVID and stay in the cabin. Yeah, no, I'll leave you a, a very brutal and, and honest review. So uh, <laughs> yeah, just make sure that yeah. everything's up to yeah, par. I'm, from a, the I'm a very tough critic. <laughs> yeah, the experienced short-term rental investor to to me that's had one Airbnb arbitrage going on here that would I you would be very upset if you saw how this was whole this whole <laughs> Airbnb was ran. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'm, so I'm happy Tony, for it. I'm excited. You? You know, Thank you. Yeah, uh, but keeping busy as always. We uh, we're, we're closing on a property actually today. I just got an email while we were recording that uh, we just recorded on that one, so it's going to be another rehab for us. Um, we've got I don't know, gosh, four different rehabs we're working on right now. Um, we're actively looking for more more short term rentals to pick up, so more of the same. Um, but uh, I'm I'm super what excited right now. Are because- you looking in for um, properties? So if maybe some of our listeners have deals they want to send to you. That is actually top secret. We're keeping that a secret <laughs> until we actually uh, close on some deals first. Because uh, what so I've it's noticed a different is that market. Market, it's a new market. It's a new market yeah, for you. Market. Okay. It is a new market. So we're keeping it. We're keeping yeah. it super, super top secret until we can close and maybe like two or three properties. Because I've, uh, I've come to realize that as I talk about some of these cities, more and more people start kind of coming in. It's not always working to my advantage, but uh, we, we got a few places we're looking at. So Freeport, Louisiana, it's just got to be booming with investors coming there. <laughs> yeah. Wait, is it Shreveport Maybe. or Freeport? Shreveport. Or Shreveport. F- Shreveport. No, Shreveport. Shreve- there you go. Oh, Shreve- Shreveport. <laughs> I've been way off this. <laughs> How long have we been talking about this property for <laughs> two years? <laughs> Maybe that's why okay, no one's bought then. it because they keep looking for, for Freeport, Louisiana. <laughs> yeah. like, There's no Freeport, Louisiana that I can find. <laughs> I've like actually offered people money to go buy this property just so we could stop talking about it. And no wonder why no one's taking me up with the offer because they, they can't even find the like town. It doesn't exist. It doesn't even exist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is Ashley Care. She's trying to scam us all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Next, you're going to start talking about uh, your, your Bitcoin uh, trading seminar, your Forex <laughs> yeah. trading class. Yeah, really. Watch out for me sliding in your DMs, guys. I'm just to know, you know how Tony Robinson has helped me make this so much money. Change my life. Forex yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's awesome, Tony. Right. Working on multiple rehabs, um, and I see on Instagram too is that you've been building your team. We have, yeah. So we uh, we added a few acquisitions, folks. Um, we added someone for social media. And then we're actually meeting up a little bit later today with someone who might help us with our kind of events and coaching business too. So just a lot of a lot of things coming down the pipeline. We're, we're continuing to try and uh, kind of ride the momentum. Yeah, awesome. Well, keep us all up to date on what you got going on. And you guys can follow Tony at Tony J. Robinson on Instagram. So if he does have any more job openings or internships, you guys can be the first to apply. There's nowhere to go. Yep, yep. Yeah. Okay, so today's episode is going to be a little different. We don't have a rookie investor on. We have an experienced out-of-state investor who is actually in Guatemala right now doing this interview with us. And she travels around the world and buys her investment properties 
Uh, she does short-term rentals, mid-term rentals, long-term rentals. And she uses real estate agents to help her do this. So she's going to talk about the advantages of having an investor-friendly agent on your team, how to find one. And actually, Bigger Pockets has a great resource if you guys want to check it out um, right now or after you listen to this episode. It's biggerpockets.com forward slash agent connect, where you all you have to do is put in uh, what market you're investing in what strategy you're using, and it will actually connect you with other real estate agents that are in that market, whether you're local to it or out of state, and then you can go through and kind of vet them. But um, these are all investor-friendly agents that you are going to be connected with. So it's like a a dating site for you and an agent matchmaking. (laughs) You set your location, your radius, or whatever, and it shows you. Yeah, you swipe left or swipe right on whichever agent <laughs> yeah. kind of meets your criteria. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I love this. I love this. I love this feature of the Bigger Pockets website uh, because finding an investor friendly agent is something that so many people talk about when they're trying to get started. And BP's like really simplified this whole process for new investors, so you don't have to go out there and, you know, shake a bunch of hands at the, the RIA or, you know, try and find other investors and get them to share their people. Like there's a platform, go on there, start connecting. It's, it makes it super, super, super easy. And as we go through today's interview, you'll, I think, hopefully get a better understanding of why having an investor-friendly agent like the ones you find on the BP Agent Finder is so important because Sarah's literally been able to build a business, a real estate business through exclusively using uh, agents to to find her deals. Um, so really, really loved her story. And she was on the OG episode or the OG podcast. Um, what was the episode, Ash? It was episode 563. So after you guys listen to this episode, if you want to find out more information about Sarah, go check that out um, on the OG real estate uh, podcast, episode 563. And she you know, gives her backstory, everything like that, how she got started in real estate investing, what she's doing now with her investing but also talks a lot more about finding an agent, working with agents, and then also uh, her out-of-state investing and how out-of-the-country investing, even how she um, is able to do that. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure you go back and listen to her episode. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Do you want to start off with just telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in real estate? Absolutely. So I started in real estate back in 2015 as a real estate agent. I sometimes joke that I was an agent for about five minutes because I fell in love with traveling and I knew I needed to find a way to work remotely. And so now I'm really excited to say that seven years later, I have a thriving real estate coaching business. I coach real estate agents from wherever I want. Right now I'm calling in from Guatemala. What a super interesting background and story that you've got. You know, when we hopped on, you had this beautiful, like, you know, terrace that you're sitting in front of. And I'm in my office in, you know, uh, Southern California. It's not nearly as much fun. But yeah, I I, I love the the story. And, you know, hopefully the folks that are, are watching or that are listening can kind of get inspired that real estate in so many ways can kind of build this lifestyle that some people dream of. So um, just from the jumps here, you're, you're giving a lot of inspiration to folks. Oh, thanks, Tony. And as an investor, it, it it really has paid off to invest long distance and invest out of state because then investing from New Zealand or Nebraska or Kansas or Canada, it doesn't really matter. It all feels the same. So I actually just went under contract last week um, from Guatemala in Des Moines, Iowa. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, congrats. Now. <laughs> Sarah, we, we brought you on more so to talk about like your expertise on the Asian side of things. And before we jump into that, I want to take like two minutes. Um, you mentioned, you know, buying real estate while you're in other countries um, where there are a lot of people who are watching the show that couldn't imagine buying anything outside of like a, you know, two or three hour drive from their house. So if you had to give like, I don't know, maybe two or three tips to someone that wants to effectively invest from a long distance, what would those be? Yeah, I think first you have to have crystal clear deal criteria. Um, You have to know what you're looking for so that you know when you see it. And then you have to take action. Um, You can look at deals for hours, weeks, months, years, and not pull the trigger. But at some point, when a deal matches your criteria, you have to write an offer. So Sarah, 
having investments out of state, you must have some kind of team that is helping you purchase these, whether it's walking the property or helping you get financing. What does your team kind of look like to make this happen? The team is crucial. I mean, none of this would be possible without my real estate agents. And so I call them investor friendly agents because they are investors themselves. They know what I'm looking for as an investor. And they do exactly what you said, Ashley. They walk the property. They send me videos. They're putting me in touch with contractors, general contractors, plumbers, the inspector, property managers. I'm really diving deep into their Rolodex. Let's talk about that more as to how you even found these agents to work with that you're relying on so heavily. Because I think, um, you know, several other people we have talked to and had on this podcast, it's maybe their key person is the contractor or their key person is the property manager. So I'm very interested in hearing more about the agent being the key person and what their role is. So first, how do you find these agents and how can someone else find an agent? Yeah, there, there's a lot of different ways, but the best way to do it is obviously online. I don't live in these markets. I'm, a lot of times I'm not even from that market. I had never even been to a market that I purchased in. And so you have to go online. And so obviously the best, best place is bigger pockets. I think you guys even have somewhere that people can look for agents. Where, where is that at or what is that? And then I can talk about other ways that I've done it. Yeah. Yeah. The Bigger Pockets Agent Finder. Um, so it's biggerpockets.com forward slash agent connect, um, where investors can go. And the, basically, it's like a matchmaking service for <laughs> agents and investors. Uh, so once you go on a, a site like this and look for an agent, what are some of the things you look for in an agent or maybe questions that you ask? Absolutely. I want to hear about their investing experience as well as their investing criteria. It often serves me if their criteria is a little bit different than my own. Because as a real estate agent, if there's agents listening, your job should be to find off-market deals. And the first question should be, should I buy this? And if the answer is yes, then buy it. And then the second is, if it doesn't meet your criteria, then you should be selling it to us investors. And so I want to find out more about the agent. How are they finding deals? That's where I find out really quickly that if they're just going to put me on a drip campaign with like an MLS search, that's not the right agent for me. And I can find that out right away by asking them, how are they looking for off-market deals? How are they lead generating? How are they finding properties? So, Sarah, I, I think that's great advice about uh, getting more insight into kind of what that agent's criteria is. But I, I guess here's a question that a new investor might be thinking, and something that I thought as a new investor myself, if this is a, a seasoned agent, uh, someone that has maybe a big Rolodex of investors that they're already working with, they're, they're a well-known commodity. How can you, as a, as a rookie, uh, kind of break into their inner circle and actually be one of the people that they share some of these pocket listings or off-market deals with? Oh, I love this question, Tony. I call it, how can you jump to the top of the list? Because that's what we all want, right? I want to be the one that gets the deal that they find. And so I think as an investor, especially as what you call a rookie, I think you have to be prepared. So you need to be pre-approved and able to finance the deal. You need to be 100% committed to buying in that market. And then you need to have that crystal clear deal criteria. And I don't know if it makes sense. Do you guys want to hear kind of what I include in that criteria? Yeah, that would be yeah, great. Please. As specific as you can get, we love. <laughs> Absolutely. So I will typically text the real estate agent my purchase price for each thing. So like, for example, if I'm open to a single family, which lately I've been telling myself to stop buying single families. Um, but if I'm open to a single family, I have a price for that. And then the price is different for a duplex, a triplex and a fourplex. So for rookies out there, the reason being is that you're going to be able to take into consideration the income from the property toward your DTI or toward you getting pre-approved for more money. And so I have a price point for each of those types of property. Um, in this case, like in this scenario, I'm looking for four units or under because I want to use conventional financing if I can. So the purchase price, then of course the deal type. So that includes single family, duplex, fourplex, and then also what class of neighborhood. So typically I've been buying in B class neighborhoods or maybe B minus neighborhoods, but everyone's criteria is going to be different. Next, I have a renovation budget. So my agent knows that I could spend up to maybe 50,000 on a single family 
or when I'm talking about a duplex or a fourplex, I typically say $10,000 per unit, or maybe it's $15,000 per unit. But if you guys are listening and you don't have $50,000 accessible, then don't put that as your deal criteria. Like you really need to figure out how you're going to finance the rehab because on a lot of conventional loans, you can't tie that rehab back into the loan. Um, but rehab, basically how, how dilapidated of a house or how value add, which is the euphemism for it needs a lot of work. Um, am I willing to go? And then I have a cash on cash requirement, a realistic cash on cash requirement, I should say. And then I also have a cash flow per unit. And so I think that that's everything. Tony or Ashley, do you think I forgot anything? Well, Sarah, I have a question. So when you present this criteria to an agent, how are you making sure that they even know what this means, that they even understand what cash on cash return is, or that they even know how to estimate what a rehab budget is? I mean, they're being your eyes on this property. So how are you trusting them when they say, oh yeah, this is less than $50,000 rehab? Yes. I love that question. So typically I'm having them send me a deal in, in today's market. I say, send me a deal, even if it's not available. So send me a deal, maybe that you found last week or send me the last deal that you purchased or the last deal that a client purchased. And then I want to see the numbers. So are you using a deal calculator? Like, do you have your own spreadsheet? Are you using bigger pocket spreadsheet? Send me a screenshot of that spreadsheet. And then I'm checking their numbers. And that's a great point is that I have had agents send me photos of a property and they're like, it's 40,000 in rehab. And I look at the photos. I'm like, no way. Like that's 75,000 minimum. And and then, of course, I go under contract on that property because it was still a good deal. And I was right. I had a GC walk the property and give me an estimate, and it was $79,000. And so I was able to say, I told you so. (laughs) And it was a great learning opportunity for the agent. And so I'm also like, I am willing to teach agents a little bit. Obviously, it's part of my business. I coach real estate agents. Um, But as an investor, I am hoping that they know that information. I love the point that you made as well, Sarah, about... um, you and the agent maybe not having the same exact criteria because you know there there probably is a little bit of um, what's what's the phrase like uh, I don't know some overlap there that can maybe not be in, in each person's best interest. But you know I, I also love the advice of coming prepared and showing that agent that you're that you're serious because someone who comes and says, "Hey, I just want a good deal." Versus someone that comes and says, hey, I'm looking for three bedrooms, two baths, um, at least, you know, 1,000 square feet, and this square three-mile radius, this condition, this year build, uh, just by nature, the, the agent's going to take that second person a little bit more seriously. And I, I just want to share one story because it always it always kind of jumps out at me when I, when I ask that question. And I have a friend who was a, a new investor. He lived in California where I'm at. Uh, he was looking to invest in Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, he was having a hard time finding deal flow. He ends up on bigger pockets, finds a, a wholesaler out there, and he's asking questions, trying to get more information about this this wholesaler's operation. And the wholesaler's a busy guy, right? Has p- plenty of clients already, and he tells my friend, he's like, "Hey, if you're really serious, come out here, to, uh, come out here to Alabama. Like, come meet me in person." My friend says, "Okay." He hops on a flight, flies out there, spends an entire day with that wholesaler. Um, just kind of shadowing him for the day. They get this relationship. He ends up buying like four or five houses from the guy. So who who are you going to take more seriously? The the guy that just randomly hits you up on Facebook or on Bigger Pockets, or the guy or girl that's willing to hop on a flight and spend an entire day with you just to build that relationship. So I'm not saying you guys need to all go hop on a flight somewhere, but just figure out what you can do to kind of put yourself above and beyond those uh, those other new investors. Tony, I love that story because that is one really great way to be taken seriously. I typically don't fly to places like Alabama. I want to fly to places like Guatemala or Brazil. Uh, no offense to anyone in Alabama. Um, but I but I mentioned that because there's other ways to what I call like hop to the top of the list. And so I think one of them is being pre-approved and ready. And so if you have a ton of questions about a market, your agent is not Wikipedia. And that's not their job to like convince you to invest in that market. There's so many other resources out there for you to gather information. And I would use other investors who invest in that market as a sounding board and really kind of, I see my agent's time as really, really sacred. And so I try my best not to be a time waster. 
I think too, as rookie investors, you need to think about what you need an agent for too. So for me, I need an agent to unlock doors for me, get me showings. And then I need agents to drop the paperwork because I don't like paperwork. I don't like contracts. I want someone else to do all that. That's what I need an agent for. So I don't need an agent to know the market. I don't need an agent to tell me the value on properties. I can analyze a deal. But if you are a new investor and you need help with some of those things, then those are going to be part of the agent's you know, that you're going to interview them and ask them what they do know. So Sarah, can we talk about that a little bit more? Or what are some of the things that a good agent should know and what they shouldn't know? So you just said you shouldn't rely on them to know the market, things like that. Can you kind of go into that a little bit more? Yeah, I want them to know the market, but I'm not going to be the one asking them a bunch of questions. So I do want them to know Because the other thing I didn't mention in my deal criteria strategy is what is your strategy? Is this a long-term buy and hold? Is this a short-term rental? Is it a medium-term rental? Which has kind of become my sweet spot, that like 30-day plus typically traveling nurse. And so now my agents know that, okay, Sarah wants more medium-term rentals. And so they're looking around the hospitals, like close vicinity to a university. And so I do want them to know the market. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't want investors to get on the phone with an agent and drill them with 30 questions about why should I invest in Omaha? That's a really quick way to have that agent never call you back. And I think it's an important distinction, right? Because like you said, there are so many other ways to get that information. And that's part of your job as a real estate investor to do that market research, to network with other investors. Um, the agent can kind of be there to maybe point you in the right direction. Like, for example, when we first went into like Louisiana, where, where I started my my investing career, um, I knew I liked that city, but the agent was the one that helped me understand which blocks to kind of avoid and which blocks I wanted to be in. So that more nuanced information is what you should look for. But I totally agree. Like you shouldn't go to an agent and say, hey, sell me on why I should invest in XYZ city. Yeah, because Ashley, you mentioned it, that that agent already has a long list of investors to send deals to, and you're trying to get to the top of that list. And so I think investors need to be careful about what they spend their time asking agents to do. So Sarah, can we talk a little bit about just how to make the relationship between investor and agents successful? Um, I think a lot of times new investors can kind of have maybe unrealistic expectations about what their agent should be doing for them. Um, so as a new investor, what, like, how can I make sure that that relationship is successful? Yeah, I think the investor needs to be willing to do a lot of due diligence. So once you go under contract, there's a lot of things that need to happen. And so your agent likely will schedule the inspection and hopefully they attend the inspection or someone on their team does, but then it's not really the agent's job to tell you what should get fixed, what should you should negotiate for. The agent needs to like keep themselves safe from liability. And so as an investor, you need to have somewhere else to turn to ask those types of questions. So I'm kind of like Ashley where, you know, I, I don't rely on, like I'm probably one of my agent's favorite clients because I don't rely on, on any of them for a whole heck of a Are lot. Are we like, sure, Tony? I'm Let's usually... ask them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm usually sending them the deals that I want them to submit offers on. You know, I'm the one that's analyzing all my own properties. Um, for me, really, like Ashley said, they're helping me get into the properties. They're helping with the transactional side of things that I don't really want to deal with. Um, but, you know, I don't really need them to tell me what's a good deal or, or what isn't. Sorry, Ashley, I know you were going to add something to that as well. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think building a relationship with your agent is so important. And it's it's easy to think of a, an agent as that they're just there to do the paperwork or they're just there to do the showing. But it really is so much more than that. They are such a crucial part of your team. Um, so I don't want anyone to get the the wrong idea that, you know, those are the only two things an agent needs. And because you'll hear people like, oh, in this market today, like paying 6% commission, like, why would we do that? It's so easy to have somebody buy a house to sell a house. It's not fair that they're making it. But um, I can you maybe go into that a little bit, Sarah, or what are some of the things that are really the value that an agent brings and why a rookie investor should have one agent on their team or multiple agents on their team. 
Yes. I, I don't even know where I would begin to do things without my agent. So for me, the agent adds so much value. So they're giving me the best handyman in town who's trustworthy and a good price. And they're going to get things done because I'm not there to check the work. And so I don't want to just get some handyman from angel list. I want a handyman that that agent has used because they're also going into my property, which sometimes are furnished, meaning I have belongings in there. And so the agents hooking me up with all of their contractors. So the handyman, and then also, you know, that phone call that you had get from a tenant that's like two months after close. I've built such a strong relationship with my agent that when the tenant says that something's broken, I'm able to pick up the phone and call my agent, or in this case, text my agent and they have someone that they can get there within 24 hours to solve that problem for me. And yes, people can find deals. Investors can find deals without agents. They can find probably great deals without agents, but I like long distance investing. And so the agent is so key to my success, even after close. And they are free to use if you are buying properties. Too. It's not like it's an added expense by paying them a salary or paying them an hourly wage that it is free to you as a buyer, which is, I mean, why wouldn't you, even if you are doing direct mail or you are doing, you know, driving for dollars or sourcing deals other ways, why not have an agent on your team too? But actually that, that brings up a good point about the pay. So Sarah, you're, you're using your agent in ways that um, in some ways go above and beyond what an agent typically does, right? Like uh, for a lot of clients, they can't call their agent and say, hey, help me with this maintenance request. So when those kind of situations pop up, are you are you additionally compensating your agent for doing those things? Or is that just because you've brought so much business to them through your purchases and sales that they do that for you for, for free? Just to kind of, how can I set that up if I'm a new real estate investor? Yeah, that's a great question. I am very careful with those text message requests. I'm not texting them every week asking for another plumber or another this because we can get a lot of that information from bigger pockets. The other tool I wanted to give people or trick I should say is I'll go on Facebook and I'll type in, Kansas City investor in the search bar on Facebook, and all of these different groups will pop up. We'll all join that group and then search within that group the word plumber. And then you'll see someone two months ago requested the best plumber in Kansas City. And I take all of that information from the comments and put it into a Google Sheet. That way, next time I have a plumbing issue, I'm going to my Google Sheet that I call my vendor list before I bother my agent. And then one way I have compensated agents in the past is I had an agent who also wore a property management hat and I self-managed that, that unit, but I did want help with what I call tenant placement. And so I think he charged like 50% of first month's rent. He ended up getting $175 more than what we had originally thought I could get for rent. And so I overpaid him. I gave him 75% of first month's rent as a thank you. And you better believe that he still to this day sends me deals. That's a, a great point to bring out too, as we're talking about how an agent is free to you as a buyer, but you can offer to compensate them for these extra things. Um, my current agent, uh, when I first started working property management for an apartment complex, I was buying like my first two properties from her. And then I also had her do all of the leasing at this apartment complex. So I could go on maternity leave and she made um, a ton of money. She made connections with the guy that owned that property. She met other investors and that kind of grew her investor pool by becoming the leasing agent of that property. So that that's a, a great thing to to bring up. And you can even... I mean, I'm sure there's other things too that you could offer an agent to pay them to do for you too. Absolutely. And a good agent is going to have a Rolodex where, no, I don't offer that service, but you can call so-and-so. And And that's what I think is really important. And one thing that I get, sometimes I get pushed back on, why do you use an agent? And I think it goes back to what do I want my life to look like? And I don't want to spend time, money, and energy on mailers and cold callers, or even hiring a cold caller. That's just not the life that I want for myself right now. And so I do rely on real estate agents to do that for me, and then they get paid accordingly. So so one, one follow-up question to that is, do you feel that there's 
benefit in a new investor and a rookie having more than one agent in the same market? Like say I'm, you know, I'm all in on whatever, Kansas City, and I want to just dominate Kansas City. Should I go out and have, you know, four agents that I'm working with in that one city to try and cover as many deals? Do I focus on going, you know, maybe with a deeper relationship with one agent? What's the best way to to handle that? Yeah, this is a very dangerous question. So I want everyone to make sure that we're, we're not twisting my answer. So yes, I do work with multiple agents in a multiple market, meaning multiple agents know my deal criteria. However, if I am like flying to Kansas City and I joke like putting my butt in their seat of their car, then I really want to use that agent for any transactions that I find. And so real estate industry is very small. And one really quick way to be blacklisted is to do someone wrong. And I do think it's wrong to like, for example, we talked about calling that agent and having them treating them like Wikipedia. Why should I invest in Kansas City? Teach me the Kansas City map. Should I invest east of 70 or west of 70? What about 71 and the Paseo? And you're asking all these questions, but then you go and write an offer with another agent. I don't think that's right. And so you have to be really careful. So I, what I do is I set expectations. I call it the expectation conversation. And I have that with the agent up front. I say, I'm sending you my deal criteria. I'm also sending it to these three other agents in town. And they all know each other. Like everybody knows everybody. And so I, that doesn't mean I'm not getting sent deals, but it does likely mean that I'm not on the top of that, per, of that agent's list. But also you're going with them if they sent you that deal. Whoever sends it to you first. 100%. Yes. And don't think that I I do get sent the same deal from multiple agents. And I will text them back. Sorry, dude. Like Mindy sent it at 8 a.m. this morning. Like, I I kid you not. Here's the screenshot. And then they're like, damn it, Mindy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think, too, with having agents in, um, you know, a market with multiple agents in there that you're using. And instead of leaning and relying solely on the agents to help you find where the best location is, like you said, west of the 70 or east of it um, to get into. I think going into the Bigger Pockets forums and asking other investors in there too about the market. Uh, also going to the Bigger Pockets rent estimator. If you're a pro member, you can get access to that to see what rental comps are in different areas around town. And you can kind of see, okay, when you get to this street, rent significantly significantly drops. Why is that? Is this one a better neighborhood than the other one? So using the Bigger Pockets tools to look at these different market you know, to analyze these different markets can get you at least a starting point. Then maybe you take it to the agent and say, you know, this is my criteria. And then what do you think? So you're not asking them to do all of the legwork and to tell you exactly where to go. You're doing your own research because you always want to verify anyways. You don't want to go off of what somebody is saying, even if Tony was to say on here to invest in Treeport or Freeport or whatever it is, Louisiana, that doesn't mean you should go just go and do it. You need to, you need to verify your own information anyways. Un- unless you're buying the house <laughs> that I have for sale out there, then everyone should go invest in, uh, in Shreveport. And actually, I kid you not, I think we're maybe like three days away from finally closing Whoa. on selling that property. So... Fingers crossed that the next time I get in front of this mic, I, I no longer own that place. <laughs> um, but, uh, but uh, you know, we'll see. But, uh, you know, Sarah, you, you brought up a, a, a few really good points. Uh, I, I love the, that you're you're kind of really going deep on those relationships because I think the the more, you know, I mean, not necessarily saying that it's like a favoritism thing, but I think the, the more that people know you, like you, and trust you, the more willing they are to do business with you. And I think if you're transparent, you're open with them and you really invest in that relationship, it does pay dividends. But, you know, th- things right now, I-, I think it's it's getting more and more competitive, right? And I think finding good deals is getting increasingly harder um, on market, off market, wh- whichever way. So do you feel that this strategy is still, like going through agents is still a valid approach for 2022 with where the market is headed? Or do you, you know, maybe anticipate adding some other ways to find deal flow moving forward as well? I think it depends on your needs as an investor. And so right now I'm really focused on my well-being and my health and my travel life and my coaching business 
and I'm actively investing. And so I do think it's dangerous for us as like faces of real estate investing to only talk about how competitive it is and how hard it is to find deals because there are still really great deals out there. I just went under contract, what is today, three days ago on a duplex that my agent found me and it's 18% cash on cash if I do it as long-term tenants but I plan on turning both units into medium term and it's a 39% cash on cash return. That's I'm awesome. Buying it That's to, nice find. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> well, it's all about the agent and it's, yeah, it's listed for, or I got it under contract for 207, 207,000 and four doors down the exact same duplex just sold for 245. And then I just happened to own duplexes two blocks over and they appraised where it was a burr that I just finished and they appraised for 265. Wow. And so awesome it's still time. possible. Yeah. Like you can still yeah. do this, guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the properties that I have under contract, three of them were off of the MLS um, that I have right now. Actually, we just closed on one of them. But um, yeah, the, there's definitely still deals out there. And it's also getting creative with what you're doing with them, too. So just the, yes, exactly. the different resources you have, the different strategies you're using. Um, if you're going to be doing your own rehab compared to outsourcing it, maybe you actually have more wiggle room than somebody who's outsourcing all of it. So just because a deal isn't a good deal for someone doesn't mean that it's not a good deal for you. And Sarah, you kind of touched on this earlier, how you, you know, work with agents and coach them to, you know, keep the good deals for yourself, but then whatever doesn't meet your criteria, you pass on to, you know, the investors that you're working with. So don't think that if you're working with an investor friendly agent that you're competing with them, like they're still going to send you deals. It's, they're not going to keep all of the good deals that would be good deals for you. Do you want to kind of expand on that a little bit more as to how you shouldn't look at it as your competition? Yeah, I think abundance mindset is so key in investing. Not only is it good for your mental health, but it's also like an attractive trait in someone. And so I actually coached an investor client last week and we were talking about a deal and I wanted to look it up online so that I could get answers like how much is rent, how much is taxes and help her. And you know what she said? She goes, oh, I don't want to tell you the address. And immediately, and immediately I was like, woo, woo, like red flag, like, wow, that scarcity mindset is going to push people away and people are going to be less likely to want to help you. And so I really believe in abundance mindset. I think there's enough deals out there for all of us. And then Tony, you asked something earlier about like why agents are sending me deals and am I compensating them? One thing that's been really nice about my network is sometimes I'll get sent a deal and I, it's not for me but it's for one of my investor clients. And so I'll immediately screenshot it and text it over to the investor and then connect the agent and the investor. And I just became both of those people's favorite person. <laughs> and so I think you're growing your network is so key. And in order to do that, you have to have an abundance mindset. Like I've met investors in Kansas city that are like, I'm not going to tell you how I find deals. And so, Ashley, I was like, okay, I'm going to find out how they find deals. And by the end of the networking event, I found out that their secret was door knocking. I'm like, okay, bro, that's not a secret. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to move back to Kansas City and like become your competition for door knocking. You could have just told me you door knock. And so immediately that guy was someone that I wouldn't want to build a relationship with because that's scarcity mindset. And that's just not attractive. Sarah, you, you, you make me think of a really good point. And this just applies to everything, not just, you know, not just finding deals, but I, I think just life in general. But the, you know, that person that had that scarcity mindset, like they're, they're letting their fear um, kind of dictate how they interact with other people. And I think that the, the better you can get at solving other people's problems, the more success you're going to find. And you could solve someone's problem because of your own unique skill or ability. Um, you can solve someone's problem by giving them information. Uh, you can solve someone's problem by introducing them or making a connection uh, between them and someone else. And I, I think especially as a new investor, because sometimes you you kind of get into this zone where you feel like you don't have a lot of value to add to someone like Sarah or Ashley or Tony, some of the, the people that are kind of doing the stuff in real estate that you want to do. But if you can better understand what each of those persons problems are, what their pain points are, and find a unique way to position yourself to be the person that solves it, you've immediately 
built up your ability to find success. So if someone came to me and said, Tony, I want to buy your house all cash over asking in Louisiana, we'd be best friends, right? If someone came to Ashley and said, Ashley, I know this secret loophole that allows you to close properties in New York within 30 days, they'd be your best friend, right? And if someone came to you, Sarah, and said, hey, I, I've got the best source for off-market deal flow in you know whatever XYZ market, they'd be your best friend. So you know, just find ways to solve other people's problems. And whether you're a rookie, whether you're experienced, you're going to find more success, most definitely. Tony, I think if someone did that to you, they overpaid for your your house in Louisiana there. I think you would be <laughs> overjoyed and happy, but you would also want to take their hand and be like, let me help you invest correctly. Here's short-term rentals. Okay, Sarah, um, um, a couple more things I want to touch on uh, before we close out here is, are there any kind of misconceptions that either, you know, maybe investors have about agents that you kind of just want to debunk for us today? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, real estate agents are not your enemy. They should be a part of your team and they have access to a lot of deals and they are not going to remember you. <laughs> and so you could talk, you could talk to an agent yesterday and tell them, hey, I'm looking for a duplex. And then next Thursday, when they find a duplex, they will send it to someone else because they forgot about you. And that is not a dig on real estate agents. That's just how it works. And so as an investor, you have to continue to stay top of mind. And so it's okay to keep checking in with them. I typically ask, how do you want me to stay in contact with you? Is it Instagram DM? Is it email? Can I email your assistant? Do you want me to text you? Do you want me to call you? Every real estate agent wants to be communicated with differently. And so I just ask them, how do they want to be communicated with? And then I stay in constant contact with them while I'm actively looking for a deal. That's great advice there. And I think that actually goes in general with anybody you're working with is how to communicate because there's so many different ways to communicate with people like Tony. I know not to text him because he always has a hundred texts unopened in his inbox. So now I just, I needed to know what kind of lock to get for my Airbnb. So I just text his wife, Sarah now. So I get an immediate response. <laughs> I love that. I have to, I also, I also, Tony, I have to say, so Sarah is my new best friend because she sent me a referral last week. Um, I, I have a business where I help real estate investors launch their Airbnb. So my, my team We'll analyze your deal, furnish your deal, do your house manual, everything. And Sarah actually sent me a lead last week. And so there you go. thank you, Sarah. Yeah, <laughs> she's, she's awesome. She's the ultimate connector. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sarah, um, just do you have any last words of wisdom or piece of advice for our rookie listeners today? I think one thing that I've been noticing is that a lot of investors are getting really frustrated. And similar to like scarcity mindset, frustration is also like not an attractive trait. And so it, you can't really tell a frustrated person not to be frustrated because that doesn't tend to work very well. But I think what you need to do is if you're feeling frustrated, which I do, I feel frustrated in real estate investing. I mean, Ashley and Tony, don't you guys sometimes feel frustrated? <laughs> all, all the time. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you have to check in with yourself and go like, why am I investing in real estate? And for me, it's so that I can travel the world. I've traveled 44 countries. I have a job where I only need my computer. And then investing is a part of my retirement plan. And so part of real estate investing is frustrated, but it's so worth it. And so if you're a rookie out there feeling like, oh, like how can I get anything under contract? It's such a competitive market. You need to take a moment to like self-reflect and figure out why am I investing in real estate? Why is this important to me? And how can I work through the frustration? Because you're not going to be at your best when you're frustrated or negative. Thank you. That's awesome advice, uh, Sarah. Can you let everyone know where they can find out some more awesome advice and reach out to you or connect with you? Absolutely. So the probably the best way is via Instagram. It's Sarah D. Weaver and on Instagram and honestly, all platforms, I've kind of monopolized Sarah D. Weaver. And then I also have a freebie for your audience. If they want to go to sarahdweaver.com forward slash freebie, I have a downloadable for all real estate investors and agents. 
Well, thank you, Sarah, so much for joining us. And rookie listeners, if you guys are trying to find your own agent or agents in a market that's either local to you or an out-of-state market, you can visit biggerpockets.com forward slash agent connect. And you can find agents there um, and use the awesome information that you learned in today's episode to connect with an agent. So Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ashley at Wealth From Rentals, and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson on Instagram. And you guys don't forget to join our Real Estate Rookie Facebook group if you are not already a member. We are growing and growing, and it's a great place to ask questions. Uh, If you want to get market specific and ask for help on analyzing a market, reach out to other investors on the forums or in the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group to help get advice on that. And before we go, Let's find out something that can help you rookie investors at biggerpockets.com.